that, but there it is. Why I, I love that little story about the uh, accordion player who's driving home late one night after a concert, and he is really hungry. I mean, he's starving, and he finally finds this all-night diner that's open. And so he decides he's going to go in, and he goes in, and halfway through his meal, he realizes that his car is locked, but he left his accordion in plain view in the back seat. Well, he jumps up and he rushes out of the vehicle, but he's too late. The windows are already smashed and someone has thrown in two more accordions. <laughs> That's a little bit of my background, so I have a lot to say. I mean, we know the importance of making a, a good first impression. Uh, I, I like also the story about the meteorologist who Hopkins, he ran up a terrible record. I mean, it seemed like every time he had a forecast, it turned out wrong. It got to be a local joke. He was on TV, but everybody was laughing because they actually began to start planning the exact opposite of whatever he said in a newspaper decided to track it, and they found out that out of a year, he was wrong three or 295 times. He was totally wrong. Well, that was too much. It got him fired, and so he moved to another area of the country, and he applied for the same type of job. And on the application, there was a blank that asked, the reason for leaving your previous position, Hopkins wrote, the climate didn't agree with me. <laughs> I think we all know how that feels, too. I, I think in, in this sanctuary, there are a lot of us who know what it means to make a good first impression. You know, um, whether you're doing a job interview or, or if you're presenting a, a musical or, a, a, or you're a soloist or you're playing an instrument and there's a critic out there who is going to write a piece about you, you know that you're not going to get a second chance. That this is it. Often in business, you have a client and whatever you do, and a lot of times it's as much you're selling yourself as you're selling the product. And if you don't come across very well, you're going to lose the sale. And yet, uh, can we be honest enough to admit that first impressions often don't tell the whole story? I love the story about the famous actress, Rosalind Russell. She was aboard a cruise ship, reclining in a lounge chair, sunning herself. A man next to her was sneezing and wheezing and coughing. His eyes were watering, and she leaned over to him and said, Sir, really, you should drink plenty of water, a lot of liquids, a lot of vitamin C, and maybe part of that liquid would be orange juice, which will have both qualities, and get plenty of rest. You'll feel much better tomorrow. Well, he didn't say anything at first. And she reinforced her prescription because she went out the next day, and there he was, same place, doing the same thing, wheezing and coughing and sniffling. And she went over and said, listen, you didn't listen to me, I don't think. I'm going to give you the same prescription. A lot of liquids, drink some orange juice, a lot of vitamin C, and get plenty of rest. And then she said, well, I should have introduced myself. I'm Rosalind Russell, the actress. How do you do, the man said. I'm Charles Mayo. I run the Mayo Clinic. <laughs> you know, the person sitting next to you right here might have a lot of knowledge. And I'm sure they do. They have a story. They have a faith walk that has directed big portions of their life. And out of that walk, God has spoken to them certain truths, certain gems that they are carrying with them. That if once you get to know them, even if you seemingly in the beginning aren't sure about that person, you might find that this person has so much to offer, can share with you so many wonderful things. And maybe the first impression that you have of the person is that uh, they couldn't know very much. Deborah often makes me do phone calling to different things that we need to 
order or get or complain about because she feels that the first impression, as soon as they hear her accent, it's like, oh, you know, this foreigner, we're going to brush her off. But when you have that Ohio accent and you're a little gritty anyhow, so, uh, you know, usually they get a little bit more quick response. But, you know, it's the second impression that so many times is what really matters. History is filled with examples of brilliant people. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart is one of them. The Emperor Ferdinand told him that his opera, The Marriage of Figaro, was too long, too noisy, would never be popular enough to draw any crowds. So Mozart obviously didn't make a good first impression. Vincent Van Gogh, he only sold one painting his whole life. Now try to get your hands on one. Well, Thomas Edison didn't make a good impression. He was called unteachable in school. In Munich, Germany, the schoolmaster told Albert Einstein that he had no potential and expelled him for being mentally slow. He said a good company, Edgar Allan Poe, John Shelley, were also expelled for being mentally slow. If we had often just taken the first impression and felt that's the whole picture, we often miss the real story and the real gems and those things that we can cherish in someone's life. And it's often when people give you that first impression and press it upon you, you start to buy it. Maybe I'm not so good. Maybe I'm not so smart. When Hammerstein, the famous lyricist and musician, wrote five Broadway musicals. Five of them which lasted on Broadway for less than six weeks. Some of them closed only after a couple of performances. And then all of a sudden he came along with Oklahoma. It changed Broadway. 2,212 performances. You know, it really is a place where we have to understand that God is ready to move us forward. We can't get trapped by other people's opinions of us. I mean, nor can we be trapped by our opinions of other people until we really get to know them, really find out what their story is. How many times have you gotten to know somebody that initially your first impression was that they were a little bit arrogant, a little bit snooty, a little bit snotty, a little bit of a kind of person that was maybe a little mentally slow and you really didn't think you wanted to be around that much. And then all of a sudden you serve with them on a committee in the church or you go on a mission trip or you do a Habitat House Habitat for Humanity and you find out, wow, this person really is a wonderful human being. They have such a wonderful, glorious spirit and your whole idea and your whole understanding of that person is totally shifted. Sometimes they have what you need. Suddenly you realize that that person was completely different than what you thought they were. Sometimes it's not the first impression, but spending time with the person that makes a difference. And sometimes, even in the ninth inning with two outs, and it looks like it's over, it looks like you've got this person paid, all of a sudden, you really understand what a wonderful, glorious creation of God they are. Today, we look at the section of the Lord's Prayer, How would be thy name? The disciples asked Jesus to, to teach them how to pray. Now, this understanding of how to live, it comes from Hagios in Greek. It really means holy. A holy God is someone who is much different than at least many times in the Old Testament they thought about God. Do you remember when Moses encounters God up on the mountain in this flaming bush? Moses turns his back to him immediately. He's afraid if he looks at him, he'll die like that. And so Moses turns around. And what's God say? Take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. Have you ever stood on holy ground? Have you ever held a little baby, newborn, and it just almost takes your breath away? And you look at how in the world God's creative energy came into this new being. Have you ever been at a wedding where you really knew those two people really super loved each other? And it was just so wonderful that you felt that the whole place was filled with holiness. Have you ever been with someone when they 
died, when they took their last breath. And if you have, and you have the sense that Jesus Christ came and took them by hand and walked them in the glory, you know that you had the opportunity to be standing on holy ground. Sometimes we have these holy moments here in the sanctuary. Those times that I can actually feel the presence of God. We start this. Surely the presence of God is in this place. Do you feel Christ is here? Do you really understand that Jesus Christ, the Son of God Almighty, the creator of everything that exists, is here? He's here. That's not just a nice idea. It's not just a good feeling. He is literally here in this place. He's ready to love you, to care for you, to forgive you, to help you, whatever might be ahead of you. When have you been in the presence of God? When have you been at the ninth inning and you thought you couldn't make it? When you were tossing and turning all night, when you didn't know which way to go, when you thought, oh my gosh, I've been abandoned by all my friends, I don't know what to do. The finances are running out. I'm not sure how I'm going to make it the next day. I don't know what they're going to do with my job. It looks like that might be over. You're tossing and turning. But somehow, some way, you got through. And when you look back, you see God's hand. And you say, oh my Lord, you were with me the whole time. I didn't realize it. I didn't see it. You were there. I was thinking about a couple of things. Being in God's presence. When we learn about the presence, we learn that God is sovereign. I love the story of a little boy who was learning to say his prayers, and he was saying the Lord's Prayer. He got tangled up the words. Didn't really understand the full meaning of it. He was praying by rote. His mother heard him say, Our Father who art in heaven, how do you know my name? <laughs> but that's, in many ways, a real truth. God does know your name. He not only knows your name, he knows every thought of your mind. He knows every desire of your heart. He knows every fantasy. He knows every challenge. He knows every disappointment. God knows you from stem to stern. He knows every cell in your body. God can see cancerous cells before anybody could ever possibly detect them. God knows you. God created you. And God is ready to take your hand and walk with you. God is soft. Many times our thought life contains things which we're not very proud of, but God knows them all and He still loves us. Whenever I have friends that visit here and come and meet me in this church, I always bring them here. One of the last ones said, Wow, this feels like holy friend. Do you feel it? When you come in here, when you realize you're in the presence of the Holy, you realize that God is bigger than we are. You realize that our concerns about us, really, but God knows all about us, and God has a larger picture ready to grant us all that we need to be a part of His glorious kingdom, to walk into His presence, to be His people, to be His creatures. Sometimes when you know that you're in God's presence, there's a certain peace that you really can't explain. There was a little girl who was going to take her first airplane ride. She asked her daddy, what is it going to be like? I, I, I just can't imagine. And right then they heard a plane coming. They went out in the backyard and looked up and said, honey, it won't be too long. We're going to be up there in that plane. Can you see that up there? Well, she looked up and the plane was so tiny. So, in that little dot, Daddy, we're going to be up there? Yes, we will be. And so finally, uh, they got on the plane, and they were flying for about 20 minutes. She hadn't said a word, and finally she leaned over to her father and said, Daddy, are we small yet? <laughs> well, in some ways, we are. Before Almighty God, we are small. Our distractions and our foolishness are small issues. God has an agenda for our lives that will enrich and grace us. 
God is not only sovereign, God is holy. Some years ago, when I was a pastor at a church in Illinois, there's a wonderful family, and Roy contracted cancer. It was a blow to the entire congregation to love them. The whole staff visited Roy, and near the end of his life, that he loved, when we took him communion and read the Bible to him and prayed with him and his family, that one day, Carolyn, his wife, called me on the telephone and she said, Roger, the hospice nurse is here and I don't think it's going to be very long. I had the privilege of getting there and time to pray with Roy and he said he was thirsty and I was able to put a little water on his tongue and it was parched lips. And then Roy himself wanted to pray. I held hands with Roy, his wife, his daughter, and the hospice nurse, and we stood around that bed and we prayed. And we closed with the Lord's Prayer, and when we had finished, I looked at Roy, and he was gone. He was in the kingdom. In the midst of tears, Carolyn, Paula, and I hugged and kissed each other. I knew it was a time when we needed to make some decisions. We talked about the undertaker and all sorts of other things. The hospice nurse went off to care for some other details. But Carol said, Roger, I'd love for you to stay if you would, just for a little while. And of course I agreed. Now this was a naturalized, it was an African-American family, but it was a naturalized citizen. And I tell you that because tradition in their community, in which Carolyn wanted me to take part, she went into the bedroom on her dresser and got some oil. When she came back, she took the oil and poured it over Roy's body. And when she rubbed every part of his body tenderly and lovingly and gently and softly, and while she did it, she sang lullabies, spirituals, and hymns. She explained that they did this because it was a reminder that the body and the life are a gift from God and they are sacred. That it is holy. And I want to tell you, as I stood there, I was on holy ground. It was a holy moment. And then she said, Roger, it would mean so much to me if you would anoint his forehead. And I took a little bit of oil and I made the sign of a cross on his forehead. And I just said right out loud, Roy, I know you're in the kingdom of Jesus. And I made that sign of the cross. You're not here. You're with our Lord. Praise be to God. Have you ever walked on holy ground? Have you ever felt so sure at that moment that God is right there with you? No question about it, that God has reached out and God has taken you and loves you, wants you to be His. But maybe the most important thing is God's eternal. We want everything right away, but it takes a while for many things to happen. It takes wine and time to age, an acorn and time to grow into an oak tree. It takes time. God is eternal. God sees our little worries of the day from the perspective of eternity. God says, trust me. Wait and watch. Pray, of course. But believe that I will be with you. That I will come to you. That I will allow you to be able to walk on a holy ground. One last incident. Some years ago, there was a lovely woman, her name was Gladys Moretta. Gladys was married to George and they were expecting their first child. She was an intelligent, a gloriously loving and caring Christian. And she was the first Hispanic woman elected to the office of deacon in that church in Hamilton, New Jersey. During that same time, there was great unrest in the community. Older Hispanic men reportedly had raped a young girl, but no one had actually seen them, and the girl couldn't identify if they were white or Hispanic. But the rumors went anyhow. Oh, it must be Hispanics. Racial divisions ran high, and just at that same time, regulators were investing farmers for the abuse of farm workers. One Saturday evening, Gladys and George were returning from one of our church-sponsored Spanish home praise meetings, and they decided to stop by the hospital so Gladys could visit 
hospitalized elder Anglo parishioner named Evelyn as a part of her deacon service. After the visit on their way home, two Anglo men driving a pickup truck ran George and Gladys off the road to cries of, not migrant, but Magnus. After much effort and work from the trauma team of three days of agony, Gladys was declared brain dead. In hopes to deliver the baby in about 30 to 40 days, her body was kept going by machines, but her body gave way on the 11th day of her agony, and the baby was born. The baby's name was Cole. She was a beautiful little girl. In our despair, grief, anger, bitter disappointment, we met together in an overcrowded sanctuary on the day of her funeral. Anglo and Hispanics came together. Unable to find seats, the crowd overflowed outside. Even in the rain, they stood and they cried and they prayed. We moved to the cemetery and finally on a rainy, windy, late summer day on a hill cemetery in New Jersey, we laid her to rest. There we found God's presence. Jesus Christ came and stood among us. He bound us together in hope and in faith and in love. It was so clear and so powerful. Things began to change even in that community. We found intimacy with each other and God, and we held George. And it was there that we saw the eyes of hope as we left the flower on the grave and kissed hope, our little girl. We left. You see, this is what the world communion means to our children in faith. No matter where they stand or fight or fall in the sight of Jesus, they are on holy ground because He is there with them. And even now at this time and in this place, in front of this Lord's table, you, my friends, are on holy ground. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus.